to it, which I would, uh, which I would suggest to you, Mr. Speaker. Had we kept to that method of fishing uh, in this province and in this country, we probably still would have a healthy cod fishery here today. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the idea of, of trawling and the uh, massive damage that that did to stocks and the fact that it pretty much picked up everything that was on the bottom of the ocean, uh, regardless of what species was being fished for, uh, had a devastating effect. So I, I would like to uh, think that the longliners were the first real uh, environmentalists uh, in the uh, way of uh, fishing and the commercial fishery uh, for sure, but uh, in the pursuit of money and uh, making a quick dollar, uh, it was not considered to be the most efficient uh, way of fishing. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, I know long lining still takes place in, in some areas of uh, Southwest Nova along uh, Georgia's Bank. And uh, again, it, it goes to the whole concern of whether this bill is actually going to put a sufficient uh, end to the prospects of exploration or actual uh, drilling on Georgia's Bank. And, uh, you know, certainly I look forward to hearing the comments from the Minister of Energy uh, at the conclusion of second reading uh, to hopefully be able to address uh, the concerns that certainly uh, were more specifically pointed out by uh, my colleague from Digby uh, Annapolis and as well my uh, colleague from uh, Dartmouth East uh, that gave uh, some of the specific uh, concerns that they had because uh, as I mentioned on Friday, uh, Mr. Speaker, this is a a debate which uh, I don't think any of us, regardless of where we sit in the House of Assembly, are interested in continuing to have uh, on a regular basis uh, because it has been a very divisive debate. It's one that has caused uh, a great deal of concern for uh, residents along uh, the entire uh, south shore of our province and throughout our entire province, knowing the importance that George's Bank uh, has. And, Mr. Speaker, it as well uh, raises the concern of, of what are we doing as a province when you look at the lobster fishery and scallop fishery and uh, other fisheries that are coming from Georgia's Bank and throughout our province, uh, how much effort is being done uh, by the government to work uh, with fishermen and uh, with fisheries organizations uh, to look at value added. Uh, for our products. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I saw recently where uh, one of the representatives for the lobster industry was talking about how Europeans were going to soon be uh, demanding that there be a, uh, a uh, standard applied to any uh, fishery products which they're purchasing to show that they were fished in a sustainable way. Uh, and they were pointing out how the lobster fishery has to make sure that the message is getting out there that fishing uh, lobsters is actually done very uh, sustainably. Uh, there is a, uh, a very rigorous process of making sure that uh, size is uh, respected, that uh, egg-bearing uh, females are uh, not brought to shore, uh, and that this is really a, uh, a very environmentally friendly way of uh, fishing for the species. But the question becomes as well as how much are we doing as a province to promote value added for uh, our lobsters? Uh, I think you're seeing more and more where fishermen themselves uh, who uh, once upon a time used to bring their catches to shore, sell it to a buyer and that was the end of their interest. Uh, you're seeing now that the uh, fishermen are starting to build cages to hold lobsters uh, to in case the prices are not what they, uh, what they expect it should be. Uh, you're seeing where uh, fishermen themselves are coming up to the city and going to other areas uh, to get a better price for their product. And now you're starting to see uh, slowly but surely where, for example, lobster tails uh, are being marketed as a, as a value-added product. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, I think there's lots of opportunities there where uh, the government uh, can play a role, uh, not just in throwing money at it, but at in uh, doing research and encouraging uh, some of these uh, value-added prospects. Uh, Mr. Speaker, right now, for the most part, the scallops that are caught off of Georgia's bank are merely shucked and the uh, meat from the scallop is, is kept and then uh, that is what is sold. Uh, the question is, is there more to the scallop that could be used uh, as a value-added product? Uh, I know as well uh, from the aquaculture side, uh, in my own county, uh, those who did start raising scallops, there was a question asked of, was there a way of being able to sell the scallop in the shell? Uh, the idea being is that when you go to a restaurant and you'd order uh, Coquille Saint-Jacques, that you'd actually have it presented in the shell. Uh, so there was a question of how do you package that, that the scallop shells so it's preserved uh, through vacuum sealing and other means. But that's, again, a way of, of putting a value added to 
uh, those types of products and uh, a question of uh, how can we get any, uh, an even higher value uh, for uh, our fishery products that are coming from George's Bank and coming from uh, throughout our entire province. Mr. Speaker, as, as I mentioned uh, before, and uh, I, I think on Friday the, uh, the government house leader mentioned uh, whether I was going to refer to the Aero disaster or the uh, Kurdistan disaster uh, off the coast of Shedabukto Bay, uh, off the coast of Cape Breton, off the coast of Richmond County. And uh, ironically, Mr. Speaker, the Department of Environment has just undertaken a study of some of the disposal sites located both in Richmond County and in Guysborough County uh, in order to determine what impact uh, there has been uh, on these sites uh, where some of this uh, the crude oil that was picked up off the shore and through the skimmers and the uh, various techniques that were used at the time uh, for the disposal uh, of, uh, of this oil. And uh, that is, again, a reminder to all of us of how easily a disaster can occur. And uh, when you look at the arrow, uh, it was a, uh, it was Cerberus Rock was well marked on the charts. Uh, it was not uh, a question of it uh, not being known uh, to seafarers and, and to mariners. It was well marked, but unfortunately, uh, an error was made and uh, that vessel ended up on the rock and eventually did break in two uh, and sink. And speaker, if you speak to local fishermen and you speak to some of the divers who've gone down uh, to the arrow site, uh, there is, uh, they are saying that there is still uh, small uh, bubbles of oil that continues to leak from the arrow. Uh, and so that's just a reminder of a disaster that took place in the 1970s, uh, still is showing some of the effects uh, to the environment by the fact that there are still uh, these small little clumps of oil that continue to show on the surface of the water uh, near the uh, disaster site. Uh, so, Speaker, needless to say, we would never want to see such a thing occur on George's Bank, whether it be through uh, an oil tanker, or even worse, uh, through a drilling activity as what we saw off the coast of Louisiana and having had the opportunity uh, this summer to attend a conference where we did have uh, a couple of uh, colleagues, a representative and a uh, senator uh, from uh, Louisiana and talk about the devastating impact that that has had. Uh, on their community, uh, on their tourism industry, and uh, potentially on so many industries uh, all along uh, the coast uh, of, uh, of Louisiana and all around the area of uh, New Orleans and that entire, uh, that entire coast. Uh, so, Speaker, the government knows this. Uh, they knew it when they were in opposition. They know it now uh, when they're uh, in government and they realize the, uh, the dangers that are at play. And as I mentioned, I, I realize that there is uh, a lot of pressure from the uh, energy industry, from the offshore industry, at wanting to have new finds uh, off Nova Scotia, because we, we all know right now there is very limited activity uh, in our offshore. Uh, we are being told that uh, the Sable project is starting to wind down. Uh, the, amount of, uh, the amount of gas that is being produced is uh, reducing uh, every year uh, at a rate uh, at sometimes even faster than what had been predicted. And uh, that has a, an impact on the government because royalties are being reduced uh, at the same time. Uh, and we all know that, and I'm sure the previous administration would be the first to acknowledge uh, the uh, significant impact that royalties from our offshore had on the revenues of this province and their ability to be able to uh, fund new programming and the increased spending which uh, took place in this province. But that is something that is going to come to an end and we're all waiting to see whether the Encana project is really going to move forward and that we're, whether we're going to see active production coming from uh, that project as well. So, Mr. Speaker, it is the challenge of being able to have the Minister of Energy as a promoter of the industry uh, whereas you've got the Minister of the Environment and Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture whose role is to make sure uh, that our environment is protected, that our fisheries are protected, uh, and even the Minister of Natural Resources, I'm sure, has a role to play in that as well. So that is the challenge that faces the uh, government, and um, we're pleased to see that there at least is an effort to continue the moratorium uh, the question remains as to whether this legislation is going to be uh, strong enough uh, in order to uh, ensure uh, that that is the case. Because, uh, again, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, 
I know my colleagues have mentioned that this is only going to extend it for a few years, and then we face the prospect of having to go through this debate uh, once again. What makes it even more uh, dangerous, I believe, Mr. Speaker, for the residents of the South Shore, Southwest Nova Scotia, and those who rely upon George's Bank is knowing the fiscal pressures that are facing the government, which would just increase the temptation to want to allow drilling for the prospect of more revenues for our province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's not a, you know, a criticism of the government, this is the reality. Uh, they have said all along that they are facing financial pressures and therefore raises the need to either make massive cuts or find new revenue. Uh, if we allow the debate to continue on George's Bank without putting in place an ironclad moratorium, we run the risk that governments, as we move forward in the years, will be more and more tempted to try to find that additional revenue and will be willing to turn a blind eye to the concerns of uh, the uh, communities regarding George's Bank and will instead be prepared to take the risk of offshore drilling in order to potentially have more revenues uh, coming into the province. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, I've, it's, it's, as I mentioned, we certainly know uh, in my uh, community uh, what impact the closure of the groundfish fishery has had. Uh, the devastating impact, uh, and I'm sure the member for um, Guysborough Sheet Harbor is very familiar what impact it has had for him. Um, in the last 10 years, for example, in the community of Ilmadam, which had a population of over 4,500, uh, we're now uh, over 1,000 less residents in a matter of 10 years. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's a devastating number for a small area such as Ilmadam uh, to have lost that many residents. And I'm sure the member for Guysborough Sheet Harbor could quote some similar uh, devastating figures from his area uh, of people who have been forced to leave uh, due to the economic circumstances and the uh, devastation brought on by the closure of the groundfish fishery. So needless to say, Mr. Speaker, we would never want to see that repeated uh, in George's Bank and to the communities of uh, southwest Nova Scotia. Uh, we are blessed to uh, have such a vibrant fishery uh, in that area, which while it's had its ups and downs, it continues to be one of the most significant uh, economic uh, and, and value, uh, valued products uh, that we have in our province. And our duty as members of this assembly is certainly to do everything we possibly can uh, to ensure the safety and security of that region, uh, of that part, of our uh, off of our coast and uh, the importance uh, that it does bring uh, to those communities uh, in the uh, bountiful harvest that is provided uh, for uh, so many years. So with that, Mr. Speaker, uh, I look forward to this bill uh, going to law amendments. Uh, I would hope government will take its time uh, prior to uh, calling it before that committee so that uh, either no rigs three or other interested parties will have enough notice uh, to be able to come before Law Amendments Committee with any suggestions they might have or any concerns as to how we might possibly be able to uh, strengthen Bill Number 82 uh, to make sure that it truly does uh, provide the necessary protections for George's Bank. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to make uh, those comments on Bill 82 and look forward to the opportunity to discuss it further at a later date. Merci. <coughs> I recognize the Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure for me to rise in this House tonight <laughs> and discuss the bill that is before us, Bill 82, dealing with an act respecting a moratorium on petroleum activity on Georgia's. Mr. Speaker, I have mentioned in this House on uh, many occasions that uh, I come from a, a coal mining family. Uh, certainly others can uh, speak about growing up in uh, fishing communities. My uh, dad, Tom McKinnon, my grandfather, Seymour McKinnon, and my grandfather, Manson Bazantson, together spent over 100 years in the pits of Pictou County. So why is George's Bank important to me? I had the pleasure, Mr. Speaker, of working in the public and the private sector of the fisheries for quite a number of years. 
I had worked in uh, the voice and print media for uh, some years, starting as a teenager. The first job I had with the Department of Fisheries, the Nova Scotia Department of Fisheries, was as a public relations officer. My second job was as manager of field services, a job that I had for 13 years. I also served as aquaculture administrator and I was a marine advisor to the department in later years. And I also worked in a couple of fish plants in Cape Breton and I had a fishery consulting company. So George's is important to me. George's, George's Bank is important to the Department of Fisheries in Nova Scotia. Without George's Bank and the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in landed value that have come from George's Bank over the years, I'm sure the Department of Fisheries would have been much smaller. It is a small department but it would have been much smaller without George's and the great resource that exists on George's. Certainly not as great today as it used to be, but a great resource. And when I was manager of field services in the Department of Fisheries, I actually did have a part-time fish harvester license for many years. And I pride it myself on going out on vessels. Every time a lobster season opened, I went out on either dumping day or first haul. I spent a lot of time aboard boats. I went out on gill netters. I went out on long liners. I went out on draggers. I went on herring saners. And I worked with the crews during those ventures to sea. And I, I, I would like to just relate perhaps the longest time that I was ever out on a vessel it was a 52-footer. And I spent five days on that 52-footer. And uh, certainly I saw a lot of sea during that uh, period. And I will admit to this house that uh, on many of the trips that I made over the years, I. I did get seasick for perhaps the first day or the first number of hours. But I, uh, I, I certainly uh, never let on to the crews that that happened to me. And uh, anything, that I did anything that I did over the side was done in, uh, uh, without notice. And uh, sometimes into the, the gales themselves, I. Uh, I, I, I found part of my contents uh, coming uh, to the ocean. Uh, however, the situation, Mr. Mr. Speaker, is uh, besides the, the coastal waters and trips on the, uh, the coastal waters around Nova Scotia, I, uh, I, I went out uh, on quite a number of the banks from St. Anne's Bank in, uh, in uh, uh, the uh, Sydney Bight area, right through to uh, a period of time that I spent on Browns. And that was quite an experience. To be on Browns Bank, as the member for Digby Annapolis would know, and also the Minister of Fisheries, to be there years ago on the opening of the Haddock Fishery that very, very lucrative haddock fishery on, uh, on Browns, which uh, is uh, not quite as far out as George's, but to, uh, to be on Browns, it was just like a city being around you. The number of lights at night to, uh, to be on Browns and see all this activity and to be waiting on Browns for the opening of the the, uh, the fishery, the start of that haddock fishery, to, to be there. And uh, of course, uh, some vessels uh, would actually start uh, a, a few hours before the, uh, the actual opening time in the uh, darkness of the morning. But uh, of course, anyone that I traveled with was very uh, law obedient. 
But uh, that experience on the, on the coastal uh, waters of Nova Scotia and also on the, uh, the banks of Nova Scotia and uh, having a fish harvester's uh, license, a part-time license, it afforded me an opportunity to have the feel for the fishery that some of the other members in this house have uh, actually had to a, a greater degree. And I have to admit that the member for Digby Annapolis and the member for Shelburne, the Minister of Fisheries, they have wrung more water, more salt water out of their socks than I have actually stood in. So uh, I, I pay tribute to uh, the men and women who have gone to the uh, sea. I, I uh, would like to perhaps recall some of the folks that I learned a lot about George's. Uh, as manager of field services, all of the uh, fish reps that we had had experience in the fishing industry. And I, I would just like to relate some of the names, uh, certainly not all of them, but the ones that taught me a lot about George's. And uh, I would start with uh, Gerald Mossman. We heard from uh, the member from uh, Lunenburg who uh, spoke so well about uh, this bill. But uh, Gerald Mossman from Lunenburg County certainly knew the fishery. As uh, did uh, Gerald Nick Nickerson from the Hawk, Lower Clarks Harbor. I, uh, I, I had the pleasure of being the boss of, of some of these uh, people, but they, uh, they were actually uh, not employees, they were friends, and uh, we spent a lot of, of time together. And certainly, I have to mention Arnold Muse. Uh, Uncle Arnold, as the uh, member for Argyle refers to him, uh, Uncle Arnold Muse, uh, who uh, was out of West Pubnico and certainly had many stories about uh, George's. And uh, I, I have to say that uh, my experience with uh, Arnold Muse over the years brought me into contact with a, a very young uh, man who now represents the, uh, the uh, constituency of Argyle. And I remember, uh, I mentioned in this house before that I remember him with skinned knees as a little boy, uh, learning to uh, drive his bicycle. And I spent a lot of time in, uh, in Pubnico and uh, got to know this youngster who I never thought I would be looking across the floor of the house at on uh, this particular evening. So it's, uh, it's certainly, uh, Certainly uh, a pleasure to be in the, the house with this uh, young fellow. Richard McDormand. Richard McDormand was from Westport and certainly knew a lot about uh, George's bank as, as well. And the, the situation with George's bank, I, I remember in 1984, it was in October of 1984, when the decision came from The Hague, the International Court, The Hague, and the situation was that uh, we celebrated, we celebrated the awarding of less than one third of George's bank. So why did we celebrate when we only got one third and it wasn't really one-third. The Americans claimed they got four-fifths of the bank. But we celebrate it because the portion of the bank that we got was very, very lucrative. And we got the best section of George's bank. And I see the member for Digby Annapolis nodding his head up and down here. He knows that we got a good deal. And that day in October 1984, I remember uh, doing a, a little dance in celebration of uh, getting 
that portion of George's bank because we could have been skunked on that as well. Just as easily, we could have gotten none of George's bank by that decision. The Americans presented a strong case. We did as well. But uh, in, in talking about some of the, uh, the fish reps that uh, worked with me over the years, and I did concentrate sort of on the southwestern end of the province, and I didn't mention the ones in uh, northern Nova Scotia or Cape Breton. But I, I wanted to mention, and I will mention, that uh, the situation is that I actually worked with the father of the member from Guysboro Sheet Harbor. And Gerald uh, Boudreau was my, one of my fish reps. I used to call them my fish reps. And he was a, he was a great fish rep. And I was very proud to uh, be associated with him over the years. And I don't know how many times he opened his freezer up to me when I was uh, in, uh, down there in Dover and uh, would take out a, a, a little bit of uh, halibut for me or something to take home from his house. And I always remember that. And I remember our member who is uh, behind me here tonight uh, when he was a young man as well. And uh, not quite as young as the member for Argyle though. But uh, the, the, the situation regarding the, the bill, the bill that is before us tonight. The, the bill that is before us tonight is a bill of great importance. It is a bill that is giving us an indefinite period of time that's better than putting a few years on it. This is an indefinite period of time, a long-term, multi-year moratorium on drilling on Georges. And we in Canada have led by example in relationship to Georges because drilling has taken place on Georges. The Americans drilled 10 wells on Georges. 10 wells were drilled on Georges, and they were drilled between 1976 and 1984. And the drilling that took place on Georges by the Americans actually was stopped because of the example that was made by Canadians. Canadians went with a moratorium, and we have led the United States of America in protection. And here again tonight, we are talking about a bill that will, in fact, send a message again to the United States of America that we are serious about Georgia's. You know, the, the uh, member for Dartmouth East talked about uh, this bill and not having a date involved with it, and that this legislature could, in fact, in three days, if it had the desire sometime, he used the term three days. In three days, this legislature could, in fact, reopen this issue. Can you imagine a legislature in this province that would reopen this issue if the science, the technology, and the expertise did not exist to do drilling safely on Georgia's? Can you imagine any legislature doing this? The Minister of Fisheries was involved as the warden of Barrington Municipality and showed leadership. He showed great leadership in relationship to no rigs on Georgia's. And he has continued to show tremendous, tremendous uh, leadership in relationship to this issue. So, 
Mr. Speaker, if in fact someday there, there is a, a, uh, a desire by some to do something in relationship to George's, what would be the response of this legislature? I think the response would be the same as it is at this time, unless there were fundamental changes in expertise in science and technology. Because I'll tell you this, members of this House, I will tell you that the Denny Moros of southwestern Nova Scotia and the other people who were against the Riggs and Georges are not going to go away. There are hundreds, there are thousands of people in southwestern Nova Scotia who know the value of Georges and are not going to let that resource be in any way threatened. So mark my word that there will be people that will come forward to members of this House in the years to come and, and uh, have their say as the people of today have had a say in this issue. So, you know, we, we talk about uh, the, the oil industry and the member for uh, Dartmouth East talked about being to Norway. And uh, he, he talked about the oil industry in uh, Norway. Well, I've gone to Norway twice on uh, missions, looking at uh, various aspects of the uh, fishery. And I, I know something about the, the oil industry as well. I, I would uh, like to perhaps mention that uh, my son is actively engaged in the oil industry and has worked his way up on uh, rigs that have uh, been in the uh, Scotian Shelf, the North Sea. He spent two years in the Barents Sea. Uh, he uh, was in the Gulf of Mexico and he uh, currently serves on a rig as a safety officer uh, in, uh, in uh, Africa. He's off the coast of Ghana in uh, Africa. So I know from uh, some of the experiences that he has had in some of these countries that uh, oil industry and the fishery uh, can now and again exist. They can uh, coexist as they do in some parts of Norway. But I will tell you this, that the situation is that when it comes to Georges, Georges is too sensitive. It is too sensitive for the oil industry with the technology that is available today, with the expertise that is available today and the science that is available today, Georges is too sensitive. And I and others cannot envisage that in the immediate years to come that much is going to change in relationship to Georges Bank and its sensitivity and its value to Nova Scotia. So the, the situation, Mr. Speaker, is that on the horizon, I cannot see activity on Georges in the, in the immediate years to come. And I cannot see any legislature in the, the future years in this province coming forward with fundamental changes in this legislation. Now, I would like to, uh, before I, I close, in relationship to this debate, I would like to, I would like to actually thank the Minister of Energy for bringing this forward. And I will not do it too profusely because <laughs> I, uh, I, I was called to task last week for uh, actually paying uh, that minister a compliment in the House. So uh, I, I, will, I will turn my attention instead to the Minister of Fisheries. And I, I want to thank, I want to thank that minister for some of the comments and some of the things that he has done 
in uh, the last number of months and uh, more recently in the, in the past few weeks. And I just want to quote that great minister of fisheries. This is what he had to say. This is what he had to say. Members, I for one have heard the many voices of the fishing industry who continue to believe that the oil and gas activities on George's Bank will pose too great a risk for this sensitive and very productive area. I have heard loudly and clearly these concerns that Nova Scotians have related to potential oil and gas development on George's Bank. I am proud to share with you that our government is doing more than just listening. We are taking action. Yeah. And that was, in fact, a, a quote directly from this good minister of, of uh, fisheries in this province. So getting, getting uh, back to the uh, George's issue, uh, and uh, once again, uh, very Order. pleased. Order. Would the honorable member for uh, Picto East uh, table that uh, statement from the minister? Fine quote. <laughs> and and uh, in in uh, in uh, closing, I I want to <laughs> in closing I want to thank all of those who have uh, spoken on this particular bill, Bill 82, from all three parties represented in this House because there have been some great words of wisdom from all three parties on this. And uh, I applaud greatly the, the member for Digby Annapolis for his involvement over the years on this issue. And he and the minister worked in tandem over the, the years. Uh, and I had the uh, pleasure of sitting in opposition next to the now Minister of Fisheries and uh, on some fishery issues riding shotgun uh, with him and certainly on the uh, George's Bank issue and other issues. I am very proud to say that uh, I have uh, identified strongly with the member from Shelburne and uh, his role as Minister of Fisheries now, but also with the member for Digby Annapolis, because the, the three of us, the three of us have stood uh, side by side on this issue, and uh, we understand each other fully. I, uh, I wish I had the uh, time on the water that uh, they have had collectively, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the uh, experiences that I have had have certainly uh, helped me to understand George's and and uh, the, the member for uh, Dartmouth East talked about studying under Elizabeth Mann Borgesi at one time and uh, I can uh, I can say that I studied with uh, that uh, great environmentalist that great uh, protector of the uh, the waters of the world and uh, in doing a Master's of Marine Management at Dalhousie, I, uh, I, I certainly had the uh, privilege of understanding issues like George's and uh, other issues in relationship to marine affairs uh, through the likes of Elizabeth Mann or Jay-Z. So I, I want to say that in some areas, uh, oil and fish have uh, mixed. Uh, however, when it comes to Georgia's, the oil industry does not have that expertise, the science and the technology, that it is not 
anywhere in the future that I can see that Georges should be exploited for, uh, for uh, oil activity. So I fully support this legislation and uh, I commend all of those who have uh, had similar words of, uh, of encouragement in relationship to Georges. So thank you very much. Recognize the Honorable Minister of Energy. And if you do, we'll close the debate. To close debate. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleagues on both sides of the House, even the member from Picto East, if you want to include him, <laughs> for their views and remarks on this proposed piece of legislation, Bill Number 82. Particularly is of some interest, and I want to commend the uh, young member, although he's no longer the youngest member in the House. Uh, and his uh, comments concerning his uh, trips uh, out on the water with his father. It, uh, it was worthy on a Friday afternoon's or Friday morning's debate to hear you speak, and I compliment you on, uh, on those trips you took and, of course, the huge influence of your father. Uh, I want to thank the member for Argyle for putting it very clearly to uh, myself as a Minister of Energy, the significance of George's speaking with the passion and clarity that he can do so often. My good friend from Digby, Annapolis, uh, who I'm going to correct here in a moment, so I've got to sort of butter him up before I start. Uh, the member from Digby, Annapolis, again, of course, who speaks with such passion on uh, the George's Bank. And, of course, my, uh, member, my good uh, friend from Shelburne in particular. I know there are other members who spoke uh, during this debate, and uh, it was on Friday afternoon when I was visiting a certain senior who said to me, she regularly watches the legislative debates, how interesting it was to, to hear us have an exchange of ideas where we don't always agree, but we have respect for each other's opinions. It's certainly clear, Mr. Speaker, that all members of this House understand that Georgia's is a sensitive marine area that deserves special attention, and this is what this legislation is all about. As I said in my remarks in introducing this bill, we've made, we may have different opinions and views in the House but at the end of the day, we're all working for what we feel is the best interest of Nova Scotians, and the debate on this topic reflected that, and reflected it again this evening. I've also outlined why we're trying to do, what we're trying to do with this bill, and that's on the public record, so I won't go over that again. But I do want to address, if I may, Mr. Speaker, some of the issues that were raised by my colleagues on the floor of the House over the last couple of days of debate. First, with all due respect, I want to correct the member from Digby, Annapolis, on a point he made. Uh, he said on Friday that the bill only takes the moratorium to 2015. And, honorable member, that is not the case. This bill removes any set of date for a review or expiration on the moratorium. This is the whole point. This bill extends the moratorium on commercial oil and gas activity on George's Bank indefinitely. And I repeat that, indefinitely. It also, it also outlines what future governments must do to lift this moratorium. A number of speakers on Friday and this evening uh, raised concerns about the fact that the bill does not ban seismic on Georgia's bank for research purposes. That's true, it doesn't. But there are a couple of points I want to make here. The government of Nova Scotia does not have jurisdiction over or the ability to ban non-commercial seismic research. It falls outside of the area of control. We share this jurisdiction with the federal government for oil and gas activity, which includes commercial seismic activity. That's why we're able to ban any, we are able to ban any commercial se seismic activity as part of this bill. Oceans and fish are a federal responsibility that falls up out of the ability of our legislature to regulate. It's very important that we continue to work with our federal partners and, of course, with the United States of America. We cannot amend this bill to ban non-commercial seismic research, and it is not our place to do so. So that's my first point. We cannot ban non-commercial seismic research in our provincial legislature, as it is not ours to regulate. I repeat that again. The second point is we do not want to ban non-commercial seismic research. We understand the importance and the need for research 
to better understand the geology of the broader area of our offshore. I think it's important to realize, Mr. Speaker, and to note for the record that one, seismic activity isn't done during spawning season, and two, studies show that seismic has no significant impact on fish and larvae beyond what would, could be considered normal mortality rates, mortality rates. We believe George's Bank is appropriately protected and seismic for research purposes. And I highlight that seismic for research purposes must meet all federal environmental approvals and would not have a detrimental impact on fish or this sensitive ecosystem. Mr. Speaker, on the matter of resolution and how this moratorium could be lifted, let's make this clear. Some members would feel more comfortable if the future government had to enact legislation to lift the moratorium rather than bring a resolution before the House. Personally, I don't see the need to do that given the appropriate and difficult three-part test that we have written into the bill that a future government must pass to remove the moratorium. If a future government sees a compelling reason to revisit the issue, they must come to the House and engage in a public debate. We have written in three barriers that must be passed, scientific evidence, a public review, and a vote in this legislature. A resolution of the House can only overturn the moratorium after a public review and a vote by every member of this House. An open debate on a controversial topic that Nova Scotians would follow very, very carefully. That is the democratic process, and I've said before, I have faith in the democratic process. Every future member of this House has to stand in his or her place and cast a vote on behalf of their constituents on whether they agree on the moratorium being lifted or not. Those are all significant points, but the key thing is we are now going to allow, hopefully, this bill to proceed through to law amendments. At that time, we're going to continue to hear from Nova Scotians. We'll continue to hear from members of this House. This is an important piece of legislation, a piece of legislation, as I've said before, I'm extremely proud as the Minister of Energy to bring forward. This is a piece of legislation that will be marked in the history of this House. And with those comments, I would move second reading and this bill proceed to law amendments. The question is for a second reading of Bill 82. Is the House ready for the question? All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed? The vote is carried. Bill number 82, an act respecting a moratorium on petroleum activity on Georgia's bank. I refer that uh, Bill 82 uh, be referred to uh, the, the Committee uh, of Law Amendments. Recognize uh, the Honourable Member for Richmond. Thank you, um, Speaker. I rise on a point of order. Uh, in listening to the uh, member for uh, Pictou East uh, speak very passionately on Bill Number 82, uh, I think it's important that whenever members are reading from a specific document, I think there is a duty upon all members to identify exactly what document it is that they are quoting from. Um, in listening to the member when he gave a specific quote in reference to the Minister of Fisheries and Agriculture, I tried to recall where that statement may have been made in Hansard. Uh, being that the member never identified what he was reading from. And now I know it actually was not a comment made from Hansard, because in listening to the responses from the Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture during the spring sitting on issues from George's Bank, his response was pretty much the same in saying that they were waiting on the science and that their decision would be based on science was the best interest. So, Speaker, what I wanted to bring to the House's attention, to your attention, the actual document that the member for Pictou East read from is actually the subject. It's an email. It looks like it's a press release. Uh, it's a message from uh, the name of the uh, Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture, and it starts off, the message is, Dear New Democrats, uh, it then goes on to talk about what the government has done, and it then is a specific, uh, the... ...the government house leader. Chris? 
Recognize uh, the member for Richmond. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As I was pointing out, the document that the member was reading from is actually appears to be a press release uh, sent out to New Democrats. And as I mentioned, I do believe it's important for you as Speaker and for all members that if anyone is going to quote from a document, that there is a not only a responsibility to table the document, but to actually allow members of the House and Nova Scotians to know exactly what that document is. So in this question, I think it's important to know the, what was being quoted from here was not answered, but it was actually a press release sent out from the minister to fellow New Democrats uh, on this uh, exact piece of legislation. Good point of order. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, you, you obviously will rule how you see fit, but uh, Mr. Speaker, that's three minutes of my life I'm not going to get back. <laughs> Mr. 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 Speaker, the, 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 the reality was that the, the member did exactly uh, as he should. He, he tabled, the document is there for, for, for public viewing, and, and that's what it is. I, I don't think any more or any less. So I think he's done more than, than he had to. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank, thank you, uh, Honourable uh, uh, House Leader. Uh, I do not think this is a, a point of order, and uh, we will move on with business. I recognize uh, government house leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now for some more riveting debate. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, could you please call Bill number 85, the Police Act? Rec uh, recognize uh, the Minister uh, of Justice to open debate on Bill 85. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise in the House this evening to introduce the second reading of an act to amend the uh, Police Act. I introduced this bill last week, Mr. Speaker, because it contains changes that will help benefit victims of crime in our province. That is why uh, Stephanie McGinnis Langley, Executive Director of Nova Scotia Advisory Council on the Status of Women, was present to lend her support to this amendment. And Julia Rostad, Program Manager with the RCMP Victim Order. Services. Order. The bill is being uh, int introduced and explained. Uh, we could have it uh, quieter in the House, please. Thank I recognize the Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Also came to the billing briefing to show support for this improvement. This amendment to the Police Act will ensure a more effective process is in place to help victims get the support and services they may need. Mr. Speaker, victims of crime can feel very vulnerable. In the aftermath of a crime against them, victims are often distraught and emotionally fragile. Our government recognizes the importance of getting help to these people. Many victims may be unaware of the services that are out there to support them, and they are usually in no condition to make the calls and do the research to learn about them. Mr. Speaker, the Victim Services section of our Justice Department helps these victims. It provides information and assistance to crime victims who need support services. It is very common for crime victims to be appreciative when they receive a call from our staff outlining services that can provide comfort and support to them. However, Mr. Speaker, our victim <laughs> services section needs to be informed who the victims are so they may contact them with the offer of help ensuring all police agencies provide victims contact information to the Justice Department is very important, just as it is important for police to provide that information to their agency's victim services unit. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, this amendment requires all police in Nova Scotia, including the RCMP, to provide that contact information to our department and to their own victim services unit as a matter of course. The change we are putting forward today will make it clear that it is a duty and requirement to provide victim contact information to ensure victims have an, an opportunity to make an informed decision about seeking support services. If a victim does not want to get be helped, the victim services staff will simply wish them well and not contact them again. The goal is to be helpful without being intrusive. Mr. Speaker, victims of crime can receive many types of support through referral from victim services staff, including the following. Education about criminal justice system, specific information and updates on their cases, liaison between victims and police, courts, Crown attorneys, and corrections. Referrals to other services, 
assistance in applying for restitution and for criminal injury counseling, court preparation, including tours of courtrooms, specialized court preparation and support services to child victims' witnesses, risk assessment, safety planning, and involvement in case coordination for high-risk domestic violence cases, assistance submitting victims' impact statements to the courts, emotional support, and short-term counseling to help victims deal with the trauma of being a victim of crime. Mr. Speaker, police are one of the most important sources of referrals. Despite good intentions and sincere efforts, victim referral processes over the past 20 years have needed some improvement. Not all victims get referred so they can get the access to services in a timely manner. Mr. Speaker, we are fixing the problem with the amendments to the Police Act, supporting regulations. The supporting regulations will follow later. Mr. Speaker, as you know, our government is committed to making life better for families in every region. Families affected by crimes against them deserve our care and support. We are making this change to make sure they get just that in a timely manner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask uh, the minister to move uh, second reading on the bill. I move second reading, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, honourable member. I recognize the member for Richmond. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, as the justice critic for the official opposition, uh, I'm pleased to be able to make a few remarks on Bill Number 85, the Police Act. And I think one of the first questions that comes to mind is, does this really require a bill? Uh, in essence, this is basically a policy directive that is going to be sent out to police forces, including the RCMP. And that exact question was asked on Friday: Is uh, why is this in a bill? Uh, well, I, I could tell you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I think I had to ask myself the same question uh, earlier this evening when the Minister of Justice tabled two bills. Um, one actually had two clauses and a total of 50 words in it. Uh, the second one had three clauses uh, in it. Now, I know, Mr. Speaker, that I have lamented in the past when government has brought in Justice Administration Act, which uh, may have made changes to 12, 15 pieces of legislation, and uh, some were quite significant, but uh, to say that the two bills that came in tonight were minor housekeeping measures uh, would be uh, being very kind. Uh, but, you know, Mr. Speaker, we all know that from what we've seen now, it's been a fairly light agenda coming from the government. So uh, at the end of the session, these bills will all be counted, and the Premier and the government house leader will say, look at the busy agenda we had by the amount of bills that were actually debated and passed. So I think it's important to make sure Nova Scotians know exactly um, the nature of, of these bills, and especially with Bill Number 85, uh, a question does this even need to be in the form of a bill? Because uh, naturally, who would question um, a decision to encourage police officers to notify victims of support services that are made available to them? Um, and second, I, I don't suspect that police officers are going to say, well, we have no choice to do this because it's now been legislated. Um, you know, I, I believe a policy directive would have certainly had the same effect. but. Uh, speaker, this is an issue which has been raised by our caucus in the past in this House uh, on behalf of uh, victims of crime and the uh, fact of some of the limits that are placed on uh, the services made available uh, to them. And I know that my colleague from Halifax, uh, Clayton Park, uh, has been uh, very vocal on this issue, uh, both with this current administration and the previous administration, on behalf uh, of victims, and I know she will have some uh, remarks uh, to make on this as well. Um, as my comments to uh, the press on Friday were, how can you introduce uh, such a policy, basically, uh, that would tell police officers and RCMP that they have to make victims aware of the support services that are available without talking about the budget? Because one would have to think that with this new policy directive, uh, basically, that it could potentially have more people accessing uh, the services that are made available through the Department of Justice. So if that is going to be the end result, that will obviously put additional pressures on the budget for victim services. Yet the minister hasn't said a word 
uh, and I believe his public comments has been that he doesn't believe it will have any impact on the budget. I, you know, like a, m a number of other things the minister has done, I, I'm left to question the logic uh, behind such a statement because if there's going to be better awareness and, and a bigger uh, take up from Nova Scotians who've been the victims of crime, one naturally would expect that there's going to be an increased cost as a result, uh, which uh, possibly if the extra funding is not put in could lead actually to reduction in services uh, for victims rather than an increase. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, it's been a difficult time in our province. Uh, we have uh, been hearing on a regular basis of uh, murders, of uh, crime being committed uh, tonight in the nightly news. It's a shooting in the West End of Halifax. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's becoming a, a bigger problem uh, for our province. Uh, you know, in many ways, we always felt that we are isolated and, and uh, insulated uh, in a ways from the crime that was taking place in larger centres. But more and more, it's becoming a reality for us here in Nova Scotia, especially here in the Halifax Regional Municipality, where uh, hearing of, of shootings and, and crime is, is becoming all too familiar. Uh, and yet we have yet to hear uh, steps from the Minister of Justice as to what is going to be done uh, to try to address that issue and the fact that you know, safety is now becoming a main concern for residents each, uh, here in HRM and throughout Nova Scotia because so many Nova Scotians travel uh, to, uh, to HRM for uh, various appointments, uh, visiting family and more and more they are becoming concerned uh, for their safety uh, when they come here to the city. So uh, if we're going to talk about uh, victim services, we can't do so without talking about crime and the fact that violent crime is on the increase here in Nova Scotia. And we, uh, we are hearing uh, as well that this, the government has put a freeze on the boots of the street program, uh, which was meant to increase the level of police officers. And, Speaker, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, head uh, officers in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality, and he was speaking of, of everything they've been able to do with the additional officers that were made available to them under the Boots and Street program. And so, uh, I, again, for this government to have frozen that program without telling us exactly what their plan is, is a great concern to us. But, Speaker, there's uh, a great number of issues which uh, I intend to uh, be able to raise during debate on Bill Number 85, but unfortunately this evening time will not permit me to uh, be able to uh, address all of those issues. So in light of the, uh, the time uh, that we have now reached, Mr. Speaker, I would move uh, adjournment of debate on Bill Number 85, the Police Act, uh, to be resumed uh, at a later date. I recognize the government house leader. Uh, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. That concludes the uh, government's business for today. And, uh, Speaker, by an all-party agreement, uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, uh, we've moved uh, opposition to Tuesday instead of Wednesday. So I'll now call upon the uh, House Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. <laughs> I recognize uh, the member for Argyle. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, of course tomorrow we'll have our house hours from uh, the hours of 2 to 6. After daily routine question period, we'll be calling resolution 1925 uh, for debate as well as bill number 80 uh, for second reading. So with that, I know I, I now call that you uh, leave the chair. The motion uh, before uh, the House uh, is for uh, adjournment. Uh, to meet again tomorrow at the hour of uh, 2 p.m. All those in favor of the motion? All those against? The vote is carried. <clears throat>